All right. So um, let's see. This is week nine, Monday. Week nine. Oh, and and December is tomorrow is December. So we've we've we're almost done with twenty twenty. I don't know if all of our problems will go away, but it's it's been a it's it's been a year. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. So we um, so last week before the break. Uh, I introduced this topic of hierarchical models, and um, and so these slides are just repeat slides. So I'm going to kind of just kind of flip through them real quickly. And we said, you know, for the for the Gibbs sampler, what we want to do is we want to draw. Uh, you know, we got this joint distribution in the end of like all of these terms, all of these parameters, and what we want to do is we want to be able to produce samples from this joint distribution, okay? Um, and um, to try to do all of the values in the joint distribution all at once is not going to, um, we might run into low acceptance rates. And I don't know, maybe you've run into that a little bit or you've seen that a little bit in the, uh, in the homework where you, in the higher dimensional ones, you have lower acceptance rates and stuff if you just try to use Metropolis algorithm. So anyway, the, the hope is we can kind of turn everything into a bunch of conditional distributions. And, um, and so, you know, I, I mentioned this hierarchical model. And the idea here with the hi hierarchical model is that, you know, maybe we're not comfortable with the idea of selecting 81 and 219 for our prior distribution, we're not comfortable with the idea that these were just kind of selected arbitrarily. Maybe we want to have something where um, they are modeled as random variables, okay? And, um, and so that's, that's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to model the selection of A and B, or alpha and beta, as random variables. And if they're random variables, that means they have their own random probability distribution and um, and because so alpha and beta are parameters of the prior distribution of theta okay so alpha and beta are called hyperparameters and if alpha and beta have their own random distributions those are called hyperpriors and the parameters of the hyperprior are called hyper hyper priors okay and so um, so that's, I think we got, we got through this, um, you know, before Thanksgiving, we got through this on Wednesday and what, um, uh, what I said we should do is rather than proposing alpha independently of beta, what we're going to do is we're going to propose some omega term. Okay. And omega is going to be where the, um, where the mode of the beta distribution will be. And, um, and if we use omega, then we can determine alpha and beta deterministically by saying um, alpha is equal to omega times k minus two plus one. And then beta would be um, omega, one minus omega times k minus two plus one. Okay? And if we do that, we would, you know, that's how we could get uh, these things. And we would just have to treat k as a arbitrarily selected constant. Um, okay, and so we said um, omega itself has to be a value between 0 and 1 because it's going to be the mode of our beta distribution. So it has to be a value between 0 and 1. And so we could say omega itself can come from a beta distribution. And so this omega term will have a hyper prior distribution. And that hyper prior distribution will have its own parameters. These are the hyper hyper par parameters. Um, but and, and we will arbitrarily select these hyper hyper parameters, okay? But, you know, the, the more steps away you get from the data, you know, the less, the less direct influence you have. So, you know, selecting 81 and 219 has, you know, fairly strong influence on the posterior distribution. But um, selecting A and B here, A, A omega and B, B omega, B sub omega, um, 
does have some influence, but it's it's like a generation removed. So so the, the direct influence is lower. So you know we might we might feel more comfortable here. But if we're not, we could also put um, additional param priors on these. A hyper hyper prior with their own hyper 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 parameters that we wanted to, but you know that that might be getting a little excessive at that point. And so our hierarchical model is uh, going to look like this. Okay, k is an arbitrarily selected constant. A sub omega and B sub omega are also arbitrarily selected, but we're going to draw omega from this beta distribution. Alpha is going to be determined once we have once we've drawn omega. Alpha is going to be set equal to this. Omega times k minus two plus one. Beta is going to be set equal to this. One minus omega times k minus two plus one. Okay, and then. Um, and then once you have alpha and beta, then a player's theta will come from this beta distribution. And then whether the player gets a hit or an out will come from a Bernoulli distribution uh, based on this theta. So this is kind of the hierarchical model for a, for a baseball player. And I, I think I got through this on Wednesday, all right? So is, is this OK? This is just a little bit of a refresh of what we did on Wednesday. Okay, so, um, and then this was kind of the diagram that we had here. We had some kind of distribution and this determines this distribution. That's gonna, we're gonna draw theta from here. And based on the theta, we draw Bernoulli values for our individual hits and outs. Okay, what we wanna do now is we're gonna use a hierarchical model for multiple players. Okay, so, um, each player is going to have their own batting average, and we're going to call that theta sub s. So player one has batting average theta sub one, player two has batting average theta two, and player s has batting average theta s. Okay. And so everything is exactly the same as far as the hierarchical model. This stuff is all the same. It's just now we're saying theta s comes from this prior distribution, beta of alpha comma beta, okay, where alpha and beta have been determined by omega and k and all of that. And then the individual values, the, the hits or outs, given some player s is going to be our Bernoulli draws dependent on this, right? So you might have a one player where their batting average is 300, and so you're going to have more hits, okay? And you have might have another player where their batting average is 200, and you're going to have fewer hits, OK? And so depending on what the individual player's theta s is, we'll determine that individual player's kind of sequence of hits and outs. OK, and so same diagram also taken from uh, our textbook doing Bayesian data analysis. And it's going to look kind of like this. OK, um, here's a. Um, this is what we call, uh, this is a diagram. And over here is our, a, a plate representation. Uh, the idea here is you have some hyper prior distribution. This, this we've said is actually uh, an, uh, a beta distribution. And from our hyper prior distribution, we draw the value omega, okay? And then omega will then be used to determine what alpha and beta are. And those alpha and beta feed into our beta distribution prior. The beta distribution prior will um, produce values, theta one, theta two, theta three, theta four, up through theta s, okay? And for each player's theta, uh, their own player's batting average, that gets goes into a Bernoulli distribution, and the Bernoulli distribution will produce values of zeros and ones, like zero, one, zero, zero, one, and, and, and this will be the different data things that we see here. Okay, so this is kind of a diagram of how the, uh, the, um, the terms work together. Okay, and I put dot, dot, dot for more players and kind of more hits. Okay, this here is what we call a plate representation. So rather than having to have draw all of this, okay, I put a plate here. This, is, uh, this rectangle is called a plate. And it basically says you're going to have a whole bunch of these things, all right? So rather than having to draw theta s producing the individual values y, 
um, I just kind of put this here and I put a little subscript S in the corner of the pl uh, plate to kind of indicate that. Uh, and then the, the plate representation, you don't, you don't kind of draw bubbles for the priors. You just kind of draw bubbles for the, the terms. So I've got alpha and beta determine our beta distribution. Those determine your thetas, okay? Or the, the um, and then the theta s goes into the Bernoulli distribution, which produces the yi. Okay, so um, so if you ever pick up a Bayesian textbook or something like this, um, I would say the plate representation uh, might might show up there. Okay, so this is uh, the plate representation of our hierarchical model. Okay, so far so good. Are, are we okay with this? All right, let me give you your first quiz yeah. answer. First quiz answer for today is D, D as in dog. D as in dog is our first quiz answer. Okay, so this is, here's our hierarchical model and, uh, and, and we've got a whole bunch of players and stuff. And so let's, um, I simplified this a tiny bit. Well, uh, so let's say we've got um, a big matrix of data for all the hits and outs of say 10 players, okay? So um, YSI is going to be the is uh, so there's a typo here. Okay, the hit or out of player S. Okay, the ith hit or out. So um, y you know, and what we want to do is we want to estimate all of the unknown parameters. So in our model, there's going to be eleven unknown parameters. We have ten theta sub S values, right? We got each player. So we have a big matrix of um, kind of whether the player got a hit or a out. Okay, and we got a whole bunch. Um, and so we have, we're going to do this for 10 players. So we want to figure out the theta s values for each of the players. So we got 10 of these. Okay. And then we also have to estimate what this omega term is. Okay. Uh, and the omega is going to determine what alpha and beta are in the, uh, in the beta prior distribution, right? Because, because the idea here is that we didn't, we're not no longer comfortable with just arbitrarily choosing 81 and 219 as my values for the prior distribution. And I kind of want to leave it open to a little bit of randomness. And so maybe it'll be something like uh, uh, 80 to 20 or uh, 75 to 25 or something, right? 72, 230 or something, I don't know. Okay, so we wanna we wanna kind of leave that we leave that open. So we're gonna have uh, omega here. Um, the other parameters that are part of our model, which is k, alpha sub omega, and beta sub omega or b sub omega, they've been arbitrarily selected, and uh, and we're not gonna try to infer it from the data. Okay. Um, if we wanted to, we I mean we could also put a prior distribution on k. Um, you know that that might be desirable, but but for now we're just gonna these are the 11 terms that we need. The, uh, the theta s, one for each player, the omega um, that does all that. Okay, so <laughs> this looks like scary, but it's not. Okay, so the joint um, distribution, okay, the po joint posterior distribution, we've got our 11 terms here, theta 1 through theta 10 and omega, okay, given our data and these kind of prior parameters, hyper, um, these uh, hyper, hyper hyper parameters here. Okay, this is going to be um, you know just using Bayes rule is going to be y given all of this stuff, multiply uh, the likelihood of our data given all of this. Okay, multiplied by the prior distribution of of our terms theta one through omega, um, kind of given our hyper hyper parameters. Again, these are kind of set divided by our uh, marginal probability. And, you know, we can just say, well, you know, this is a constant. So we're just going to say it's proportional to it. Okay. This is a constant with respect to these terms, right? So with respect to theta one through theta 10 and omega, this, this is not affected by that. So we're going to just say it's um, proportional to this. And really, the numerator is just the joint distribution of everything. So here, uh, rather than, so y given all of this, uh, multiplied by the probability of this, this is just the joint distribution of kind of all of these terms. 
Okay, so the last row is just the joint distribution of everything. And, um, you know, because of the hierarchical model of nature of the data, you know, the player, the outs, the hits and outs of player one, which would be Y1 being all of these things, being whether they got a hit or an out, really only depends on the theta one. Okay, theta, theta one. We, like, you know, if we look at our, our diagram, these hits and outs are, only depend on this. They don't depend on the other, the other parameters in our model. Okay, so, so what I can do is I can kind of factor the joint distribution of all of this into saying, all right, uh, first we've got um, y1. So this is basically just the, the vector of hits and outs for player one depends only on theta one here. The vector and outs of, uh, for uh, player two only depends on player two's batting average, theta two. Um, and, and that goes all the way up to player 10. So the hits and outs of player 10 only deter uh, are determined by the batting average of player 10, okay? And then we also now have the prior distribution of theta one given um, uh, omega and k, prior distribution of theta two given omega and k, all the way up to the prior distribution of player 10 given omega and k. And then, uh, and omega itself comes from a, uh, its own pri <laughs> hyper prior distribution uh, with parameters uh, a, a omega and B omega, right? Is this line okay here? Where I've, I've factored all of this into all of these, uh, all of these pieces here, okay? And then, um, and now I'm just gonna kind of rearrange some of this stuff, okay? Where I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna basically bring the theta ones together and then I'm gonna bring the theta twos together and then, you know, the each, I'm just lining each thing up here, okay? So here I've got, um, this is gonna be uh, determined by this. This is gonna be determined, you know, we got these two together, Y10 through here, and then we still have the prior, the hyper prior for omega uh, given the hyper hyper parameters, okay? And then, um, and there's a, because uh, alpha and beta are determined from here, I just kind of, swap them down to here. But uh, I, I explain more of this on the next step here. Okay. So, um, so we can kind of factor everything. And, and these are beta distributions where we've got alpha and beta, right? So we factor the joint distribution of everything into distributions of each row, basically, uh, you know, y1, y2, y3, whatever. Okay. Into kind of the um, basically, uh, each row in Y is going to be the result of Bernoulli. So these are these are going to be Bernoulli uh, probabilities, okay? And then each player's batting average, okay, is going to be a random draw of the beta distribution that depend on alpha and beta, all right? And alpha and beta are determined by the omega and k values. And then this value omega all the way at the end is the result of a beta distribution um, and these are kind of just, uh, these are just hyper hyper parameters that we've arbitrarily chosen. All right. And so once we've kind of, whoops, factored it into here, we can create a Gibbs sampler that will kind of take, take advantage of the structure of all of these conditional distributions. So, um, so what, what's key here is that when I want to get, draw a value, for theta one, the posterior distribution of theta one, okay, the posterior distribution of everything is like all of this stuff, okay? But if I just want the posterior di distribution of theta one, it, I only have to worry about the terms that have theta one here because I've been able to kind of factor everything into, um, uh, into kind of these conditional distributions. So uh, the posterior distribution of theta one doesn't care about y2 or theta2, y10 or theta10 or all of this other stuff, okay? So the posterior distribution of theta1 is just going to be um, uh, determined by basically the values in player one's row of hits and outs, 
um, and the prior distribution of theta one, which, which is determined by alpha and beta here. Does that kind of make sense? As, as far as, uh, so, you know, <laughs> so this is kind of a mess and this is still kind of a huge mess in that we've got so many terms, but because everything's all conditional, uh, factored into conditional distributions, the posterior distribution of each of kind of these terms can be, is, is basically just each of these things, okay? Determ determined by this. Okay, so, um, so we're familiar. Uh, we're familiar with the relationship between the posterior distribution of a Bernoulli or binomial data with a beta distribution prior, right? So this was, this is way back from week one, but we said, if you start off with a beta distribution prior with alpha and beta, okay? And you have kind of uh, a bunch of zeros and ones, you basically take the sum of your, your hits, okay? And you would add that to alpha. And then you take basically um, how many misses you have, which is N minus the number of hits, okay? Or the outs, and you add that to beta, right? So when, you know, when we had, if the prior was 81, 219, and we had five hits and five outs, right? Five, five hits and 10 at-bats. Okay, we would add five to 81, and our posterior distribution would be a beta distribution with terms 86 and 224, okay? I, I, I hope we remember that. Okay, and so this is, this is how we have it. Our, um, our posterior distribution is this. We can turn this into a binomial thing. So rather than having to do, deal with the sum of this, sum of the y's, we can just use k, okay? So we can say k sub s, which will just be the number of hits that player s earned, okay? And, um, and in that case, the posterior distribution for the player's batting average, theta s, is going to be a draw from the beta distribution of alpha plus k sub s and uh, shape parameter two, which is beta plus the number of misses or number of outs, which will be n minus k sub s. Okay, sorry, I got a typo extra parentheses here. Um, okay, is, is that okay for the posterior distribution for theta s? All right, and so. In, inside our Gibbs sampler, okay, well, we'll uh, again, the goal is to just produce a whole bunch of random values from our posterior distribution. And so with our, the hierarchical nature of our, our data, we can just say, all right, I want to create a bunch of iterations here. All right, so I'm going to have, this is kind of a, I've got a loop and a loop, okay. Um, and so, but, on our iterations, we've got values of omega and k somewhere uh, in our environment here. And so that's going to determine what alpha and beta are. And then as far as the Gibbs sampler goes, basically for each player, we're going to sample a random value of theta from the posterior distribution, OK? Um, k, which is the vector of the number of hits, exists in the global environment. And n, which is a vector of the number of at-bats, you know, um, it also exists in the global environment, OK? So we're going to just, uh, we've got a big matrix thetas, uh, one, uh, one row for each player, and then, I'm sorry, um, one row for each iteration, and we've got one column for each player. So, uh, you know, if, I, if I'm doing a thousand iterations, thetas will be a thousand rows and 10 columns, because I've got 10 players, okay? So one, one row for each iteration, one column for each um, each player, okay? And we're gonna say um, what we wanna do is we just want one value from the a random beta distribution, one, one random value from the beta distribution where the shape parameters are alpha plus, plus the number of hits, okay? K for player S. And, uh, and the second shape parameter is beta plus basically the number of at-bats and n for player s minus the number of hits. So basically this is the number of outs or the number of misses for player s. Okay, and so this is, this is it for kind of part of the Gibbs sampling where we're just sampling each, each value for each player here. Values of theta sub s here. All right, 
does this kind of make sense here? All I'm doing is I'm just implementing this this line of code or this into a, uh, lines of code here. Okay. Omega, on the other hand, all right, Omega is not as straightforward because if you think about um, the joint distribution of everything here, okay, the joint distribution of all of this, we look at what Omega determines. Omega actually plays a role in determining what alpha and beta are for all of these terms here. Okay, so omega, omega plays a role in all of this. And so, um, so what's the posterior distribution of this? I, I don't know, okay? I don't feel like doing the math. Maybe if we sat and did the math, we can figure it out. Um, but in, in this case, we can use the Metropolis algorithm, okay? And so for the Metropolis algorithm, we just need a function that's proportional to the posterior distribution of omega, all right? And so I don't, I don't know what the posterior distribution of omega is. We just need something that's proportional to it. So from Bayes' rule, we know that the po posterior distribution is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. And because we only need something proportional, we don't need to worry about the denominator in Bayes' rule, which is, which is nice. Okay, so well, what, what is this? All right. So here we've got the posterior distribution, uh, and I'm just going to leave it all at, all as is. I think I think I can actually ignore all of this because omega. Once you've determined what theta one is, uh, this this part doesn't matter. But um, but anyway, so I think I can actually throw this out. But I but I kept it in there and it didn't break. So. Um, even if I keep these in there and I, it's not necessary, these, these would just become constants anyway. So anyway, so we have the hyper prior distribution for omega, which is this beta, uh, which is a beta distribution. And I've just arbitrarily selected um, A omega and B omega to be three and seven, okay? These are just arbitrary terms. It doesn't really matter to be honest, okay? I mean, you just, for the hyper, for the hyper prior distribution and your hyper hyper parameters, you basically want um, something as close to un, something fairly uninformative. Okay, so by choosing these, arbitrarily choosing three and seven, basically we're going to have a um, uh, a beta distribution where the mean is 0.3. Okay, but there's there's going to be a lot of spread, right? So any value from like 0.15 to point uh, five and stuff are going to have high probabilities. Okay, you, for the hyper prior distribution, you don't you don't want to pick something super narrow. You want to just kind of because this is what's going to determine what omega is. Okay, and so um, omega is going to determine the values alpha and beta in these uh, prior distributions. Okay, and uh, and again here I've just kind of arbitrarily selected k to be three hundred. So. So the terms k, a, a omega, and b omega, these have arbitrarily been selected. Okay, and now we just need to get some function that's going to be proportional to this, or you know, or we we know the posterior is proportional to this, so we just need to figure what this out is. Okay, and so um, so we can do that, right? So the posterior we know is proportional to this. And uh, with the values of theta s that we've kind of fun um, sampled, all right, we can get the posterior distribution easily, right? So uh, for each of these things, the y given your theta, those can be found uh, using the binomial um, function, okay? So the, the, each of these things can be done by taking d binome. Uh, where k is just the uh, the sum of the y's, and n is the length of, of the y's. So we're just going to say, okay, what's the uh, what's the probability of getting um, this particular k given n and theta? Okay, and then uh, and these terms, the probabilities of theta s given alpha and beta, those can be found using the beta PDF. All right. So first we got to calculate what alpha and beta are using omega and k. All right, and then once we have that, we just calculate the beta distribution um, 
for our, you know, the value of theta. And we do this for every player, okay? So we just say, what's the probability of getting this, uh, this particular value of theta if, if we're given this, and that comes from the beta distribution. And then, um, and then we just need uh, the omega. And these, these values are determined already. That's three and seven, okay? And we're just gonna use the beta distribution there. Uh, typo there, okay. And so, and also to avoid any computational values or issues where you get values near zero, we're going to deal with the log probabilities and use a sum rather than a product of all of these tiny probabilities where you, you know, probably run into an underflow. Okay. Um, does this kind of make sense as far as what we're doing here in terms of um, we, we want to just take the product of all of these things. And so I'm just going to plug all of this in here, okay? So I've got, um, we've got omega, we've got k, we've got theta. Theta is kind of a vector of all of these things. And so we're gonna just kind of find um, k exists in the global environment, n exists in the global environment, and we've got our theta here. And so I'm gonna do d binome of k, n, and theta. We're gonna calculate the log of those, and we're gonna add all of them together. Then we're gonna calculate the beta distribution of theta with the alpha and the beta that have been determined by omega. And we're gonna take the log probability of those. And then we're also um, gonna add on the beta distribution probability, the log, log probability of the beta distribution of omega given kind of our hyper hyper parameters, alpha and beta, A omega and B omega. All right, okay, let me go ahead and give you your second quiz answer. Second quiz answer is E, E as an elephant, E as an elephant. Okay, the other aspect needed for the Metropolis algorithm is just a way to kind of propose values, okay? And so the proposed value, I'm just gonna say um, draw a random uh, value from the random normal distribution where the, uh, the mean is set to be our current value of omega. So we got omega proposed as a random normal value where the mean is current, set to our current value of omega and we got some standard deviation. Here I've got standard deviation set to be 0 0.05 so that um, we, uh, you know, we get some, some value here. Okay, now um, we would run into problems if the proposed value is outside of the range zero and one. So I'm gonna say, if, if the value of omega proposed is bigger than one, then take the minimum between this and one, so, so we have that. And if the value of omega proposed is less than zero, then um, take the max between you know omega proposed and zero, okay? So anyway, so we just run this just to kind of ensure that the proposed value that we get is always within what's allowed for what omega could be, okay? Because we'll run into issues if omega turns out to be negative or if omega turns out to be positive, it would cause problems. Uh, is it common? Oh, okay, oh, I'm sorry, I missed a question here. Is it common to use a loop for this situation? This is a few minutes ago. So um, were you talking about this slide right here? Um, Yes, I don't know. Um, yeah, I think I think a loop is fine. <laughs> um, yeah, in Gibbs sampling, we often use loops because because um, uh, you uh, the next value is determined by the previous values, right? So um, if I go all the way back to here, you know the like x three depends on what was drawn for x one and x two, so we can't just vectorize and do all of them all at once. Um, we kind of have to have the previous values and then calculate the new one. And then we move on to the next iteration. We get the next value. Okay, so this is um, what our posterior distribution um, things look like. Okay, and then we got the proposal function for Metropolis. Okay, and so um, well, if I combine all of this into some code, this is kind of what our Gibbs plus Metropolis algorithm sampler might look like, okay? So this part is the Gibbs sampler where we just draw 
each value based on its conditional distribution. So conditioned on everything else, the posterior distribution for theta comes from a beta distribution with alpha plus ks and beta plus ns minus ks. So we've already talked about that. Where alpha and beta are determined by the values of omega and k. And then um, over here, we've got the metropolis algorithm. OK, oh, so here I'm going to store all of our, our values of thetas here uh, into here. And then so now I'm going to propose a new value of omega using my function propose. And then, um, and here I have the function log prob to calculate the probability of our proposed omega versus the probability of the current omega. Okay, so we got um, probability proposed divided by probability current, but because it's a log, it's going to be log probability of proposed minus log probability of current. Okay, so this is going to be kind of our our log ratio of whether we move or not. So uh, omega log probability of the proposed thing minus log probability of the current thing, which is based on k and our current values of theta. And then, uh, and this is the metropolis part, you know, we sample a random u. If, if log u is less than whatever this log ratio is, okay, then we will accept it. Otherwise, we don't, right? Uh, and if we accept it, the omega proposed becomes our current omega value. And I'm going to just go ahead and store the omega and I'm going to keep track of them in this vector omegas. Is that okay? All right. So um, let, me, um, let me make this text bigger for you guys. Okay, so um, here's my Gibbs sampler. This is basically all of the code that you've already seen. Here, I'm gonna um, simulate some data for 10 baseball players. So I'm, uh, I've got some imaginary batting averages. Um, the number of at-bats they have is also a random number, some um, with a mean of around 500, but it's a Poisson thing, okay. And uh, okay, and I'm gonna just fill in whether they got a bunch of hits or misses. Okay, so if I just say you know player one, they have a whole bunch of hits or misses. Zeros for a miss, one if they get a hit. Okay, and so you know what's the uh, the sum of y for player one uh, na dot r equals true. Um, you got a total of 118 hits. Um, and uh, what is the, uh, the length? Um, actually, the number of at-bats, number of at-bats for player one is 486. OK. And so if I do 118 divided by 486, this is player one's empirical batting average is around you know, 243.2427, OK? Um, so anyway, we'll go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and take kind of the row sums and the k's and the n's so we can kind of deal with um, binomial stuff rather than um, Bernoulli stuff, but, but it's fine. Okay, so I've got k is 118, number of at-bats is 486 and stuff like that. Okay. So that's, that's just to simulate the data. So here's my simulated data for the number of hits and their number of at-bats of 10 different players. And, uh, and now I'm going to set up my um, Gibbs sampler. All right, I'm going to run out of time here. OK, so we're going to say let's, we're going to do 15,000 iterations. I'm going to keep track of all of the different thetas that I've simulated or uh, sampled. OK, so this is going to be a huge matrix. Uh, I've got 15,000 rows and 10 columns, okay? Because I got 10 players, and I'm going to do 15,000 iterations, and then I'm going to keep keep a vector to keep track of all of my kind of random omega values that I'm drawing. So here are the um, hyper hyper parameters: alpha, a omega, b omega, and k. And I'm just going to start with an arbitrary value of omega of 0.27, okay? Just kind of our initial thing. 
Um, so using my arbitrary value of omega and my hyper hyperparameter k, okay, we've, we've got kind of the current value of alpha and beta for our beta distribution. All right, here's my function to propose values for the metropolis algor algorithm. And here's my function to calculate uh, log probabilities for the metropolis algorithm. And this is the code for the Gibbs sampler, where in each iteration, we go through each player and we draw a random value of theta. And then we also draw a value for omega using the Metropolis algorithm. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, run that and, um, and it's done, <laughs> okay? So that was the, um, that's the, distribution, or that's the uh, Gibbs sampler, right? That went really fast. I'm worried I broke something. Okay, so now we got a, hopefully, hopefully we have 15,000 values for omegas. Uh, looks like, it looks like we do, okay? And, uh, and let's just take a look at our chain. Yep, so I got a whole bunch of values of omega here. So, um, so lots of different values of omega ranging anywhere from 0.25 to 0.31, it looks like. Um, we can create a histogram here. All right, so these are the values. So remember, omega is the, um, uh, the value for what, um, uh, that determine what A and B are, right? So remember, we, we, we said we're uncomfortable with the idea that A and B were just arbitrarily selected to be 81 and 219. And so maybe uh, we're going to have, we, we have to pick two numbers. Right now, we've currently selected K to be equal to 300. So we need two numbers that add up to 300, but maybe we don't want them necessarily to be 81 and 219. Maybe we want them to be like 80 and 220 or 75 and 225. Or maybe we want it higher, like 80, uh, 85 and 215 or something like that. So, so we want to kind of determine these. And so these are the values of omega. And, um, and, and they, omega can go anywhere from 0.24 to 0.32. Um, here is just uh, the quantiles. And so the 2.5 percentile is around 26%, 97.5 percentile is around 30%. And um, 50th percentile is around 28%, okay? Um, I can also add a um, density plot here. Maybe, maybe that's, that's the way I'm going to try to do it. Okay, so that's kind of, uh, that's what we have there. And then the mean value of omega that I have. Okay, again, this is a random sample of what omega could be, the mean is around 0 0.2809, okay? And the reason why we would want something like this, we have a distribution of omega now is, now we have kind of a, um, the random distribution of our, of the value that we're interested in, okay? Um, we've also sampled everything for every single player. And so here I've created a little function so that we can look at a particular player and look at their quantiles and um, just kind of their number of hits and at-bats and things like that, okay? So, um, so if we look at player one, player one had 118 hits, 486 at-bats. So if you do 118 divided by 486, their empirical batting average is 0.2427, okay? Or 0.2428. And if, um, and based on our posterior distribution, which is just a random sample of a whole bunch of theta values, the player's batting average could be anywhere from 0.227 to 0.290. And here's kind of their, um, their the histogram of their, their batting averages um, of, of their theta values. Okay, we can do it, look at player two, player two um, had a few more, had 139 hits and 493 at-bats. So their empirical batting average is a little higher at 0.282. And, uh, and their posterior distribution their, uh, in, that we've sampled here uh, also reflects that. Okay. 
And so, so here again, all we have now is just a whole bunch of, we just have random values drawn from what we believe to be the posterior distribution uh, for each player. So I'm gonna have, you know, I basically have 11 of these posterior distributions. I've got one for every theta, one for each player. Each player has their own theta and their own distribution. And, um, and we've got um, one for the omegas, uh, where the omegas of everybody can be um, uh, anywhere from you know, 0.26-ish to 0.3 and something like that. Um, OK, well, I am going to run out of time here. But um, so, so this is kind of how we did it manually. And, um, and I guess on Wednesday, I will introduce uh, JAGS. JAGS is, a, is another program that um, can produce, uh, that, that can be done for Gibbs sampling. All right, so the, um, so writing your own Gibbs sampler in R is fine, but there's another program called uh, JAGS, stands for just another Gibbs sampler, okay, and it uh, it can produce it um, it produces values um, via Gibbs sampling here. Okay, basically it's a separate program. It's not run inside of R. It's a separate program, and you have to kind of download and install it separately, and then um, and then you interact with it from R. So um, you'll write some code in R. R will make a separate call to or will interface with Jags. Jags will run. And JAGS will return its values. So you have different, um, you have these interfaces for like, like if you want to use JAGS in Python, you can. You would have to ins have JAGS installed, and then you'd run some code in Python that would interact with JAGS and things like that. Okay. Um, JAGS is based on um, there is there is a predecessor to JAGS called Bugs. Uh, Bugs was Bayesian inference using Gibbs sampling, and um, and it was first developed by, I, I forget who it was developed by, um, but it was kind of proprietary. And so somebody created like an uh, open source version of it, open bugs. And then, um, and I guess they weren't updating it often enough. So somebody else got tired of it and created JAGS. And, um, but now JAGS, I don't think JAGS has been uploaded since 2017. Um, I mean, it's still very functional and very good, and people are updating the interfaces between JAGS and R, but JAGS itself hasn't been updated since 2017. So I don't know if um, someone's going to come along and do something else. There's a, there's another uh, that there's all sorts of stuff being developed all the time. So um, <laughs> so I kind of have to keep relearning things. But um, but anyway, I'll I'll uh, we'll we'll get into this. On, uh, on Wednesday because I run out of time here. All right, but anyway, this is um, just kind of running the, uh, the Gibbs sampler and it just gives you a whole bunch of, of values here, which again, um, as far as um, Monte Carlo methods go, you know, we don't know the exact distributional, functional form of the distribution, but having a whole bunch of values sampled from it is often close enough or good enough approximation and, and we can perform inference there, right? Using Monte Carlo integration, Monte Carlo estimation. All right, let me give you the last quiz answer for today. The last quiz answer is C as in cat, C as in cat. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll end here for now. And then uh, on Wednesday, um, we'll look at JAGS a little bit uh, more in depth uh, we can further develop our model so that k is not just a ran, um, arbitrary number with like 300, but we can put a prior distribution on that as well. Um, and, and so we'll take a look. All right, so we'll end here. Uh, we'll see you guys uh, on Wednesday. Have a good day.